Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Center of Excellence for Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health Consultations Conference. The consultant is in reducing barriers in IECMH consultation through IECMH virtual office hours. My name is Lynn, everyone, and welcome to the Center of Excellence. For My name is Marcia Mason, and I will serve as your session moderator. I'm joined by Chris Ward, who will serve as our technical host. The session is being recorded. Transcription is available through the Zoom platform. And should you have any questions, please feel free to relay your questions to the chat. We will have time at the end of the session for questions and answers with that said, I'd like to pass it over to Lindsay Van Dyke, who will be conducting a workshop presenting a digital poster with the group. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Marcia. My name is Lindsay Van Dyke, and I'm coming to you today for, as the supervisor for ICMH in the Northeast and Central region of Pennsylvania. Um, I live in a more remote area of the state and we typically have less access to services. I'm gonna let my co-presenters introduce themselves as well, but we're coming to you today from different areas of the state that present unique challenges, which is partly why we partnered together to create this new service. Hi everyone, my name is Jeannie Frost and I am a program supervisor in Southeastern Pennsylvania. So our area includes Philadelphia and the surrounding counties. So I live in a more densely populated area of the state, but there are many barriers to accessing community services here as well. Hi everyone, I'm Lourdes Johnson. I'm a consultant for the Southeast region. I'm in the Philadelphia and surrounding counties and it's the same sort of background as Jeannie mentioned. So we're very excited to be here today. Uh, thank you for joining us. And I'd like to start by talking a little bit about why we named our presentation, The Consultant is In. And we think of this phrase as having a few different meanings. Um, and each one of those meanings ties into the solutions, skills, and strategies that we'll talk about today. So first you can think about the consultant is in, like you would say, the doctor is in. For us, this means that we're present. We're available to the field when consultees reach out for help. And in this presentation, you'll hear us talk about the impact of COVID-19 and how we found ourselves literally on the outside of early childhood programs. So we needed a new way to be accessible to caregivers and families and office hours gave us a way to do that. And then a second way of thinking about the consultant is in has to do with our relationships. We asked ourselves, how can we stay connected and truly be in relationship with early childhood caregivers and families during COVID-19 at a time when caregivers are stretched so thin? And what does it take to join in a supportive relationship with another person in the short period of time that we have with them? Uh, this was a new experience for our consultant team. We never had a short-term service like this before. So today you'll hear us talk about how we grew our skills as a workforce to be able to do that. And then a third way of looking at the consultant is in is related to our equity goals. As a statewide program, we've been intentionally making changes to remove barriers and increase access for people who have not yet had the benefit of IECMH consultation. So an important goal for us was to create entry points for early childhood caregivers and families who have not accessed our services in the past. And we will talk about the strategies that we use to do that. So now I'll pass it to Lindsay to tell you more about our consultation program in Pennsylvania. To give you an idea of how we had to pivot during the pandemic, first we need to tell you about what our program looked like before that. So the Pennsylvania Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health Program goals are defined by our work for the Office of Child Development and Early Learning in the state of Pennsylvania. And those are to help early childhood professionals and families build confidence and know how to support young children's social emotional development, to reduce early childhood suspension expulsion practices, and to connect families and childcare programs to community resources on behalf of children. It's important to note that our team is compromised of consultants that have a variety of education and experiences. Our team is made up of professionals that come to us from the early childhood field, as well as the mental health field with a focus on early childhood 
learning. Uh, we are proud of the range of knowledge that our team brings to the work as we feel we are very well-rounded and have the ability to support one another. We achieve our goals through our child-specific services. So our child-specific IECMH program is grounded in infant mental health principles and based in the pyramid model framework. So we're looking to place our services within a continuum of supports in Pennsylvania, ranging from promotion to prevention and finally intervention. Child-specific services are often viewed as an intervention for that child and then prevention for all the other children in the classroom who are typically benefiting from the improved social emotional climate of the classroom. We think about office hours and how it fits into the continuum of services and within the universal tier of the pyramid model by enhancing an effective workforce. It's an effective strategy in both promotion and prevention, and we can help develop a plan of strategies, but still be effective part of intervention. Like when a program or a family is looking for referrals for identified children's needs. So next we're going to listen to our director, Brandy Fox, talk about how office hours fits into our infant and early childhood mental health consultation program. Hello. Hello, I'm Brandy Fox, the director of Pennsylvania's Infant Early Childhood Mental Health Consultation Program. The program has been sustainably funded and expanded since our 2006 pilot year by the Office of Child Development and Early Learning, primarily through CCDBG funding. The global pandemic created an opportunity for reflection and innovation around expanding our program reach and increasing access to early childhood systems partners and families across the Commonwealth. We are very excited about the increasing utilization of our virtual office hours approach. Believe it moves us a few steps toward equitable access to consultation services and provides more of an in the moment holding space and supportive conversation for our consumers. So we created office hours because we've realized that we had to shift and adapt our service model. During this time, we no longer were able to provide on-site consultation. We were not getting the same volume of requests for services, and we knew the need was still there, probably even greater, but we were not able to reach the caregivers and families who needed us. We pivoted to develop teleconsultation services, but even with teleconsultation, face barriers. The pandemic created staffing shortages that limited the time teachers could spend talking to consultants outside of the classroom. Quarantines and classroom closures made it difficult to create the consistency and commitment needed for child-specific consultation work. Another equity barrier was access to technology. Not all early childhood programs had a computer or a tablet to access teleconsultation. Then another COVID pivot was a discussion group we called the holding space, where early childhood caregivers could come together to listen and support each other. Holding space showed the power of reflective listening, but during the pandemic, not all caregivers and families were in a place to be able to offer a listening ears for others. Many of them needed someone else to be able to listen to them, and they needed someone to help them figure out a plan of what to do. So that's where the office hours idea came from, organically and from multiple team discussions, while the brainstorming came from the consultees in the field. So let's start by talking about office hours as a concept, and then we're gonna go into more detail about how it actually works. So with office hours, we really had three goals in mind when we first developed the concept from that brainstorming um, among our consultants that Lo told you about. So our first goal was to create a holding space where we could use our reflective listening skills to give caregivers a place to hear their own voice and understand themselves a little bit better. The second idea was to build a place for collaborative problem solving. So this is where we could use what I call a thinking partner and use our coaching skills as consultants to help our consultees figure out their own solutions. Um, a place where people are able to find their own answers and we could be really more effective in building capacity and our consultation work would have more of that stickiness when we were helping people figure out their own solutions to the dilemmas they were facing and that would lead to more long-term change. And then the third purpose was our equity goals. So as I mentioned, we wanted to expand access to consultation for early childhood caregivers who had not had the opportunity to use our services in the past. 
And we also wanted to reach families in a new way. So families have always been involved in our consultation work, but they didn't have a formal entry point to IECMH consultation before office hours. And then another equity goal was reducing barriers to consultation. So my colleague Glow told you about how our child specific services often require an investment of time, flexibility and staffing on the part of early childhood programs. But, and not all childcare programs have the resources to make that investment. And then during the pandemic, even more programs experience this lack of resources. So office hours gives early childhood programs a path to participate in consultation in a short-term needs-based way that is more sustainable and accessible for all of the programs in Pennsylvania. And then another barrier we wanted to address is the sense of stigma that still exists around mental health support. And we know that some early childhood caregivers and families don't access consultation because of this stigma. So we thought office hours could give folks a positive experience of consultation, sort of like an introduction to what consultation feels like. And then by doing this, we could, we thought we could reduce that barrier of stigma and increase public awareness of consultation as a preventative mental health and wellness service. And sometimes we've even found that caregivers will come to office hours to ask us, how can I talk to a family about social emotional concerns in a more positive way? So office hours can be a place for teachers to script out that conversation and start a partnership with families in a compassionate, strength-based way, which will produce better outcomes for everyone. So office hours really works on that promotion and prevention level as well. So now we'll go into depth about how office hours works. And we went through a lot of trial and error to find a successful model. So we will tell you about all the lessons we learned along the way. So let's explore the doctor's office concept. Early on, we realized that in order to accommodate multiple requests for appointments that were happening at the same time, we needed a system where we could greet consultees while also offering them a private space to interact with a consultant. We found Zoom to be a great platform for accomplishing this task. We're able to use the main room of Zoom as our doctor's office waiting room. So like a doctor's office in the waiting room, we welcome those consultees in and explain the process of how office hours will work. We also found that having that waiting room attendant is great not only for welcoming people, but also as a support to the consultants that might be taking those calls if they need additional support in a breakout room discussion. So some of the pivots we had to make along the way were making sure we welcome consultants when they entered and explain what was gonna happen when they enter the Zoom room. When you enter a Zoom expecting to have a one-on-one -on -one call and see seven or eight other people in the room, it can be really intimidating. So making sure you're acknowledging that. Also, Breakout room tips, make sure you need more rooms or you have more rooms made than you actually need. We've noticed, I think like everyone else, technology has its glitches and its moments. So making sure you're prepared and having additional rooms, as well as we've been able to rename the rooms with the consultant and the consultee that's coming into care. So we know where to put them. And in order to make everyone feel comfortable in a situation, consultants and consultees also have the ability to rename themselves and identify themselves with their pronouns so that they can feel safe in the setting. So in this slide, you'll see a quote from a consultee from our feedback survey that we take after the sessions. And you'll see additional quotes all throughout this training from consultees and consultants that have all been part of this process. So now we will hear from some of our consultants about their hesitations in starting something new. We heard, when we heard their concerns, we knew what we needed to prepare our consultants for the next steps. What I was initially concerned about in starting the office hours consultation model was a shortened amount of time in order to speak with the caller. So they would typically have, you know, between a half an hour and an hour available to devote to our conversation. And I was concerned that that wouldn't be enough time to really get into the root of the problem and be able to brainstorm some solutions. Knowing that I wasn't going to have the time to form the relationships with the teachers and the directors that I typically do when doing child-specific consultation. 
I knew it was gonna be a quick, you know, I had to have an answer for them right away. Um, and I was nervous I wasn't gonna be able to take the time that I usually like to take to form relationships with the people that I work with. Um, my first impression of office hours was like, how are we gonna do one more thing? Exactly. So we started with a pilot area in the eastern part of the state, small number of consultants and region who volunteer and felt comfortable participating and continue to support the team by building comfort and confidence. There were some areas to consider, such as being mindful of consultants' background and expertise. Some have early childhood education focused backgrounds, while others had mental health degrees. Also concerns around needing to know all the statewide referral resources to support. We also wanted to allow space for consultants to feel comfortable to say, I don't have the answer, but I will find out and get back to you. It is also efficient to have backup consultants, as Lindsay mentioned, in the main room, room who can help support, look up phone numbers, and find immediate resources. We also allow consultants to choose their own appointments. We list all the appointments on a spreadsheet, and consultants can read the registration information, including the concerns. And then they can sign up for the appointments that feel most suited for them. For example, if the consultees lives in the county they know and the resources, or if the consultant's concern lines up with the consultant's strength and interests. We also provide opportunities for consultants to shadow other consultants during office hours. Shadowing is familiar because it's part of our training model. So it is a good way to build your confidence and comfort level. Lesson learned is, first we learn that we're capable of doing this. As Dr. Spock said, you know more than you think you do. We also rediscover an IMH ICMH truth that Jerry Paul once told us, how you are is more important than what you do. So office hours is more about what we do in an appointment. It's an opportunity for consultants to show up for others and use themselves in a therapeutic way. So scheduling is an important topic to consider also, because not only do we need to appeal to consultees time and give them flexibility to meet their schedules, but also the need to consider the consultant schedules as well, as they're an integral part in staffing our calls. So therefore, we had to be really intentional about trying to pick somewhat consistent times so that we could plan ahead and give our consultants time to block off days or times in their schedule, while still offering some flexibility of times for consultees to call in. We've tried a few different days of the week, and you can see on the chart in the screen, um, the timeframes that have been the most successful for consultees. We found based on our data that Fridays tend to be the most successful for Pennsylvania. And the most popular times of the day typically tend to be morning and then around lunchtime or nap time. Some of the additional data that we've collected is we've held 18 sessions since the start of May of 2021. Typically, like we had mentioned, on Fridays, and we run ours on the first and third Fridays of each month. We, to date, have had 156 office hours registrations, with the average length of appointment being about 30 to 45 minutes, and consultants spending an additional 30 minutes, typically, of follow-up, which usually is an email that includes resources or things that they had talked about. One of the lessons that we've learned along the way is to make sure you're offering varied times throughout the day and the ability to reschedule. So we know with the pandemic and the stress on the current workforce situation in early childhood, that often schedule chains happen in the last minute. Directors end up in classrooms, teachers can't get out on the break that they are expecting to do. And so therefore you need to be prepared for cancellations. Currently our cancellation or attempt to reschedule rate is about 15%. So we're doing pretty well with sending out enough reminders to keep people interested and in holding their appointments. And with the office hours format we have, consultees are always able to reschedule for any upcoming office hours session in advance. So I am going to talk a little bit about how we have folks register. I did want to acknowledge there's one question about what platform we use for virtual office hours. And so we do use the Zoom platform for video conferencing. We also have a lot of requests for telephone appointments. So we just um, call the consultee at their appointment time. Um, and then there's another question about um, how we're going to continue as a pandemic. Um, changes and hopefully some of the stress is released. So we'll, we will definitely talk about that as well. Thanks for those questions. 
Um, so I'll talk a little bit about our registration system. Um, when we first started, we were using the Zoom platform and we used the registration feature within Zoom. And folks could choose their date and time. We would ask them a couple registration questions about general information about the child care program. We also asked them to give a brief summary of their concerns. We did ask for some demographics like children's age, but we requested that no private information like children's names, no private information be shared. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we started using Zoom, the Zoom registration, but then we quickly moved to Google Forms for registration. So we still use the Zoom platform for the video conferencing, but we use Google Forms to have folks register for appointments. Because with Google Forms, we could really use a lot of question branching, um, and that lets us ask different questions for early childhood caregivers versus families and also systems partners who may be looking for an office hours appointment. And also Google Forms gives us data reports in real time. So we can just take a look at, um, we can just take a quick look at how we're doing with data collection. And so now this is what our registration form looks like. As you can see, you can register right with your phone. You don't need to have access to a computer to participate. You can also request a telephone appointment and about 25 to 30% of consultees do request telephone appointments. So that is popular. Um, after folks register, we send them an email to confirm their appointments. We started out with a really simple confirmation email with just the appointment date and time. And then we realized that we needed to add more details to let people know what to expect and to help them feel more comfortable participating. So for example, in that email, um, now we let consultees know that their information will be kept private. Um, we ask them to make sure that their name on the Zoom matches the name they registered with. And this is one of those technology features that Lindsay mentioned that really smooths things out if we can do that, because then we know who's coming into the Zoom and we can pair them with the correct consultant so that once they come in, everything goes smoothly and um, they feel more comfortable. We typically send a couple of appointment reminders, maybe two or three, um, with one the day before the appointment and then another one the morning of the appointment, and that has really helped reduce cancellations. And one of the lessons that we did learn was that it was helpful to tell consultees up front that the appointment will need their focused attention. So now we also include that in the confirmation email and we ask that they do, you know, set aside, carve out that time, set it aside and take the call out in a quiet spot away from distraction so they could really focus. We also let them know upfront that office hours does work like the doctor's office concept. So when they come into the main Zoom room, they may see other teachers and families waiting for their appointments. And this was something that we actually learned about through feedback surveys from consultees. And they told us that it was uncomfortable for them to come into the Zoom with other people, mainly because they weren't expecting it. So, um, and now that seems to be resolved now that they know what to expect when they come in. And we wanna make sure that we're really offering people the predictable, predictability and transparency that is so important to create that sense of psychological safety. And Lo will talk about that next. So now we will watch a short video of consultants experience with creating a safe space. The power of just listening, validation, and helping them get to the heart of the matter. Um, so office hours definitely is a, a, a boost of um, energy when you can really hear somebody's concerns and then be able to provide them immediate feedback and immediate support, even if it is just listening. Just having somebody there to listen would be um, sometimes what they need. Sometimes teachers and directors will get onto the office hours and what they need is to feel heard. Um, they want to know that what they're doing is, is the correct steps, that the con their concerns are valid, and really guide them on to what to do next. This is very similar in the child-specific consultation where we, these teachers and directors don't know what to do next with the children or the classroom and things like that. And we're there to let them know, yes, your concerns are valid. Your, your thoughts are in the right place. And here we can guide you together um, in what to do. Um, our, just the work, the desire to be supportive, um, the 
need that the caller has for somebody to hear them, um, to be supported and to feel heard and talk through the situation. Uh, sometimes commiseration is needed, uh, just knowing that they're not alone and it, what they're experiencing. Um, and that happens both in the office hours call, even in that short time frame. And it definitely happens when I'm doing child specific consultation. So I, I like that, um, you know, ability to be there for another professional and to be able to offer support. I've also found that there are times when the person has the solution or has some ideas already in the back of their head, but talking to an outside party really helps them bring it forward and they just needed somebody to talk through it with, which is has been incredibly beneficial. So while I was initially nervous about a short time frame and their availability, it's actually I think worked in our favor to get right be able to get right to the point. So we try to focus on several necessities to create a safe space. Flexibility. Consultees and consultants are deciding the time and date. Consultees can choose telephone or Zoom. Transparency and predictability. We tell them exactly what to expect during the call. Respect privacy. We ask consultants not to use child family or teacher's name, and we let them know that they will keep their information private as well. Setting up boundaries to help them build trust and feel safe and heard. Validation is very necessary and meaningful to both consultants and consultees. We also create predictability by asking them to tell us how much time they have so we can get to the heart of the matter. For consultees to be open and honest with us, we need to create an environment that is welcoming and nurturing. You can also see that we received some feedback from the consultants and a lesson learned is you can see in this quote that the folks responded to the sense of feeling seen and heard. This consultee talked about how she felt how much my voice matters and immediate response. We also make sure to follow up if we told consultees we would email them for check-in or send resources. This creates trust and tells them that you can count on our promise, we're thinking of you, and you are important. There are some more ICMH approaches that we use very intentionally to create psychological safety, always assuming positive intent. The consultant can remind people of what they are already know. It's reassuring to realize that you have your own wisdom and knowledge and that can help guide you. Office hours is also a service that provides community care. We can let people know that you're not alone. Name it to tame it. Help them identify how they're feeling. Talking about stressors can decrease some of these feelings around them and be able to move forward. Creating an action plan helps consultees to feel more in control of how to move forward and can provide reference for continued guidance and support. Reminder that relationships are the intervention. We hope to see this through the parallel process, the understanding that by consultants providing a safe and supportive environment for consultants to process their feelings and problem solve, that they will in turn be more likely to provide the same environment for the children they are supporting. So I, um, I'm noticing one question in the chat that I just want to tell you guys about, which is a question about is consultation available just for service providers or for parents also, and it is definitely available to families. Um, that was, um, we did not realize it would be so popular with families, to be honest, um, and Lindsay will tell you a little bit more about our community outreach in a moment, but what we are experiencing is that about 20% of our appointment requests are from families, so we've started more customized office hours uh, publicity for families um, because we have realized how important it has been for them. Um, so they definitely have access to it as well as, as well as early childhood providers and also systems partners. And we'll tell you more about that as well. Um, so now I just wanna share with you some case examples of typical office hours requests. So these are compilations based on real concerns that people shared when they filled out their registration forms. And we're gonna let you listen to their voices. Hi, I'm reaching out about a little boy in my classroom. He's been really aggressive towards another child in my room and it's been hard and very frustrating. Um, he also seems to want a lot of our adult attention. 
We're really trying to focus on all the positive things he's doing, all, all the positive behaviors, but he's still using a lot of negative ones to get our attention. We are really stuck, don't know what to do or try. So thanks for any help you can give us. Hi, uh, I'm reaching out because my kid is having a hard time controlling herself. Uh, she's acting a lot differently than she used to. Um, she gets real angry easily when she hits, she kicks, she yells a lot, she spits, she's been breaking things. She also has a hard time talking about her feelings. Uh, she didn't used to do that. And we're having a hard time talking things through without acting on them. Uh, I'm hoping that you can help me out. Thank you. So you can hear in these examples, I hope that that gave you a sense of what it's like to join someone in an office hours conversation and start out with this concern that they, that they share. Um, and you can really hear in these examples that folks are identifying behaviors as their main concern. That's very common. And you can also hear in each of these that there is a kernel of a possible solutions that can be fleshed out when caregivers have space to talk about it. And when the consultant can help them reflect on the child's behavior through an IECMH lens. And here are two more examples. I will let you listen. Hi, I'd like some help. We have a baby in our infant room who's very attached to us. She will not let us put her down and will not eat sometimes. She often cries uncontrollably and cannot sleep unless we're holding her. Her family says that they do hold her at home because of her crying, and we think she's demanding this at the center too, but we just can't hold her all the time because we have other children to care for. We are holding her because we don't think it's fair to leave her cry, but we would like some help to figure out what to do. Hi, my son has sensory problems. And he's recently he started complaining and his clothes feel funny and he says they hurt his body. It's a battle to get him dressed every morning and it takes an hour of bribing and arguing with him. I'm not sure if we're doing the right things and all the arguing is really upsetting me. He used to have early intervention, but he graduated. So we need suggestions and we really need help. In these examples, you can also hear how the behavior concerns are impacting the adult child relationship. And that is also very common. Um, you can hear that consultees could benefit from concrete problem solving and maybe connecting to some outside resources, but they also need an opportunity for reflection and perspective taking. Um, we can help them talk about what does this concern mean to me? What thoughts and feelings are coming up for me as I talk about this? What is this like for my child? What needs are they trying to communicate? Um, and so these are all things that we can help them with reflecting and taking the perspective in an office hours conversation. So in office hours, it's equally important to use reflective listening skills and help consultees create a plan and connect folks to some longer term resources. You might notice in the chart, and I know Jeannie had mentioned we were going to talk about this a little bit, that a large majority of our consultees appear to be early childhood caregivers. But we need to talk a little bit more about that to understand. So community outreach was an integral role in the success of office hours. And as we mentioned previously, in order for it to catch on or become something known in the community, we really had to promote our new supports to the field. So we started this by starting very small and created a flyer that would be used to introduce these supports to the early childhood caregivers in the field, as well as those professionals supporting the providers and the children as well. So we really started our efforts aimed at the early childhood caregiver field, considering that's what we do in child-specific consultation. Our goal in reaching the systems partners was to increase collaboration among the caregivers supporting the children to break down some of the silos that impact the work. So we, again, focused our initial promotion of office hours by sharing an in-system wide newsletter to all early childhood providers. And then as we moved along, we noticed that parents started sending in requests and wanting to have appointments. And we noticed the ability to support other caregivers of children early in life. So in that, we learned that we created an additional flyer that was really geared more towards families. 
And our team continued to do an amazing job promoting both flyers at community meetings open to the public and to those interested in supporting early childhood caregivers and children. So we also noticed that programs had started to share our flyers with their families as well to get them support outside of the centers. So while at first we had to publicize it intensively and frequently, after about nine months, I'm happy to say that publicity is less intensive and office hours is becoming a more widely known resource. We like to think of it almost like creating a new habit, being intentional at first and letting it catch on to be a continue, continued support for the future. We hope we can create to be the first point of contact or the first ones they call. So something we learned is because IECMH isn't as widely known in our state, especially outside of the early childhood field, since the majority of our work is supporting caregivers within the early childhood care setting, it was really important for us to acknowledge on our flyers for crisis support for families to be able to reach out and understand what our services could provide and how that differed from crisis. So we felt it was important to acknowledge that so we could build capacities of caregivers to know who to contact in the moment when they were having crises too. So we talked about the variety of consultees, but another important point to mention is we wanted to break down the early childhood caregivers as well. While the majority of our calls come from caregivers in childcare settings, we have also been able to connect with family providers and group providers that historically don't get as much support in the child specific model of consultation. So these providers typically don't receive as many supports and therefore the ability to reach them with this service has been extremely important because it creates a new entry point into the world of IACMH for those that might not have ever used it before. Also exciting to note is the reach of IACMH in terms of early childhood professionals and families has also increased. Uh, we started collecting data as of January in 2022, and the data shows that 66% of the consultee registrations for office hours have never worked with an IACMH consultant before. And therefore, we're really making a new entry point for our services. Lindsay, we do have a quick question. Um, yeah. About whether or not um, does the agency need to be a part of Keystone Stars? If you could say a word around that. So because our services are aimed for Keystone Stars, that is typically what we use for child specific. However, um, office hours has been open up to anyone, especially now that we're also including families and systems providers, we've opened it up to anyone um, that's supporting children in early childhood. So what happens after the appointment? We send individualized resources to consultees, which provides efficiency. And at times, if they need one to two quick strategies, we provide it for them. This helps cut out the unneeded request for consultation, or like if they really just need early intervention. Most appointments have a follow-up email with resources or referral information. Some consultees can request another appointment, but most do not need, or their next appointment is to discuss a different concern. At times, follow-up for resources within community agencies is necessary. We can send them our newsletter, our brochures, or any upcoming PD trainings as well. Lesson learned, we have begun to send a feedback survey with the resources to be able to access the thoughts and feedback from the consultants to improve this model. This was not implemented in the beginning stages. So I am going to share some data that shows how office hours is really paving the way to more equitable access to consultation for all children. Um, and I want to just there's a few questions I wanna take a second to answer. One was, um, did we consider other telehealth platforms like doxy.me? We did not really, mostly because um, we had used a lot of Zoom um, with our early child care providers in the beginning of the pandemic. We had our holding space discussion groups who were over Zoom, so we knew people were comfortable with it. So that's certainly a good question for exploration for the future, right? But we um, pretty much focused on Zoom. Um, another question was, how long is a typical office hour session? I would say between 30 to 45 minutes. Um, some of them do go longer. It really depends on how much time the uh, consultee has available. We ask them to tell us that upfront so that we can plan for that. Um, but typically 45 minutes. Um, 
And then we do offer follow up low shared we do um, often email con uh, consultees to follow up. There have been times when an office hours um, conversation was sort of converted into a child specific request so in the more complex cases we certainly um, offered that to the consultee and um, worked with the child care program or the family to um, convert it into a longer term child specific case. Um, and then. And then we will, um, there's a question about the flyer, which we can um, think about. Definitely the flyer is available on our website. Um, and um, there's a question about Keystone Stars, which I'm gonna tell you about in a moment. And then our last question of the future, which we will definitely talk about. So I think I've covered all the questions um, and I'll tell you about this data that we have here. So, um, and this talks about this equitable access and making that possible for children. Um, and so first we found that about 15% of our appointments were with families or caregivers participating in publicly funded programs like state funded pre-K, Philadelphia Universal Pre-K and Head Start. Normally our consultants don't serve children enrolled in Head Start, but through office hours, we found we can give Head Start families a service that complements the Head Start mental health consultation model. And so now we'll look a little bit at program, child care program quality, um, because we know that this is definitely an equity issue. Uh, Pennsylvania has, and someone asked about Keystone Stars. So Keystone Stars is Pennsylvania's quality rating and improve, improvement system for child care programs. Um, so programs are given star levels based on quality standards that they meet. Star four programs have to meet the highest number of quality standards. Um, and typically, the vast majority of our child specific consultation is with star three and four programs. But as you can see on the slide through office hours, we've been able to reach caregivers from programs at all star levels. And actually over a third of office hours appointments were with caregivers from star one and two programs. So we've helped a lot more of those programs engage with IECMH for the first time. And we've even started working with some of them on child specific consultation. So office hours really has been an entry point for them. We also found that about half of all office hours appointments were from counties in Pennsylvania, where a large majority of children with child care subsidies we're not enrolled in high quality programs. So it's even more important for us to engage those caregivers because we know that the children in these programs experience are experiencing a greater number of risk factors. So from a resilience point of view, we can make a big difference when we build the capacity of the adults around them. And office hours gives us a way to start that work. Um, it also helps us move forward with cross systems collaboration. Um, more than 10% of appointments were from systems partners like early intervention and behavioral health professionals. Um, and this collaboration is really important because we are linking services and helping to our colleagues and other systems to become ICMH informed. And we can go to the next slide. We also found that office hours created a new point entry point for in terms of children's ages. So during the past year, about 80% of our child specific consultation services went to preschool age children with only 6% under the age of two. But for office hours, we found that about a third of the children were under the age of three with more than 15% under the age of two. So it's really allowed us to be more proactive and work on that prevention level to get caregivers of babies started off on the right foot. Um, we also noticed, speaking of families, that office hours has let us uh, reach families of infants and toddlers because families haven't always connected with the idea of mental health consultation for such a young child, but they do seem to be connecting with the idea of talking with someone one on one and getting support through office hours. So we are very excited by the results we've seen over the past year and all this data is telling us that we are accomplishing what we set out to do. And so now I will turn it back to Lindsay to tell you about our plans for the future and our questions. Yeah, so with the success of office hours, it leaves us pondering for future plans. And I'm just going to summarize this in, in mind of time. But we've had such an interest in families, and that's huge. And so we hope to continue to capitalize on this, figuring out where we can brainstorm to come up with and publicize our flyers to reach more families. Um, we currently are being featured on the Early Intervention Technical Assistance webpage, but thinking about placing flyers at pediatricians' offices, libraries, WIC and public assistance offices, 
also other areas where caregivers of early childhood aged children might be. Uh, our goal is to continue to work on a Head Start collaboration so that they might be able to office or offer office hours as a complement to our service. And our long-term goal of getting a better sense of who is accessing office hours, where are they finding our flyer, where are they hearing about us about, and continuing to do follow-up surveys to see long-term outcomes. We are currently working on a Spanish flyer for our dual language caregivers and working to provide office hours consultation in Spanish to meet the needs as well. We're working on collecting more demographic information in an intentional way. So we're working to make sure we don't discourage consultees from registering by, for an appointment by asking for personal information about themselves when they feel like they're calling to discuss a concern regarding someone else or a problem that they aren't necessarily associating themselves with. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Lo to talk a little bit about how Office Hours has benefited us, not only consultees, but consultants. So as Lindsay mentioned, we talked about how office hours has positively impacted the early childhood education community. We also want to show a small clip about how it's impacted our team. Brad, it's been rewarding to get on a call and um, be able to feel like, oh, I, I got this, I can do this and I can send them resources. And yeah, this sounds a lot like what I've been doing in the past. So it feels good when you get on a call you listen to their concern. It sounds similar to other classrooms that you've been before or other kiddos that you've helped before. And this is what worked and maybe this will work for you. So it, it's, it feels good when you can share those same strategies with the teacher and they can feel like they can try something different. I've gained a great deal of confidence, I think, from the office hours experience. Um, from initially being pretty nervous about it. We're talking to uh, people that we don't know uh, most of the time that are strangers from across the state. And they're, you know, calling into office hours because they have an immediate need for support. Um, so it feels, it can feel a little fraught and stressful in beginning it, but the ability to jump right in and talk about, talk through the issue with them has provided me with so much professional satisfaction, it's almost like immediate gratification um, for an IECMH consultant, is that you're, you're getting almost immediate feedback from that caller. I see, yes, this is exactly what I was looking for, or thank you, this is the resource I needed, or you know, I really appreciate just talking through this and somebody hearing me it's really, it's a, it's a nice boost to be perfectly honest, um, professionally for my day. Um, so we can also see how this has really been beneficial for our staff who felt challenged during the pandemic and how they could support the needs in the field. We all know a little positivity can go a long way. So huge, ginormous thank you, whether it was taking in office hours or helping him behind the scenes with entering data or answering emails. The consultants are responsible for the success of the program. You met a few of our consultants during this presentation and you can meet our whole team here at the link. Special thanks to Brandy Fox, our Director of Cross-Sector Infant Early Childhood Mental Health Initiatives at the Pennsylvania Key, and Jen Murphy, our Infant Early Childhood Mental Health Program Manager. Also special thanks to special voice appearances of family members of consultants. Thanks to the Pennsylvania Office of Child Development and Early Learning, and of course, the Center of Excellence. You'll see our website here. I know someone had mentioned in the chat, if we could put the website up, this is where you can find all of our resources, as well as our email for contact and our website for our wonderful newsletter that we send out monthly to the field. Um, we can answer any additional questions at this time too. Jeannie, I'll pass it off to you. You've been answering questions. Yeah, I've answered a few in the chat and um, I, do, I do wanna call attention. One question was about um, the supporting our consultants through supervision training. Um, yes, we do. Um, our program is fortunate enough to be able to have reflective supervision, group reflective supervision for all of our consultants. And that is certainly one of the workforce supports that we have. Um, and we also um, allow a lot of conversation when consultants are finished with their um, office hours appointment, they usually come back and talk with um, this program supervisors who can 
uh, sort of help them process what they talked about and get some support that way. Um, as and um, as well as get a sense of if there's any changes that we need to make. And then there was one other question about um, maintaining office hours after the pandemic. We are definitely committed to maintaining this. It's been incredibly successful as a complement to our child specific services. And moving forward, I think um, they will both just continue to enhance each other. Um, and the staff generally just sort of balance. They take office hours appointments on the days when they're home doing their other office responsibilities like writing reports and um, so they will just sort of take their appointments on those days and on um, that they're not in the field. And um, one last question I see um, so about um, consultant credentials. Um, I believe most of our consultants are master's level professionals with um, backgrounds in either early childhood education or mental health. Um, and so we do have both range of experiences professionally. Um, so thank you everyone. I think that's, please feel free to reach out to us. You have our contact information. We'd love to talk um, to everyone who's interested um, in finding out more about our office hours program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh